We recently completed a landscape assessment of risk-sharing relationships, and we did this in collaboration with the University of Washington, uh, Lou Garrison, and Josh Carlson. And we had three questions we were trying to understand. First, how common are they? Second, what are some of the benefits that we hope to understand? And finally, what are some of the challenges that folks face? So the first issue is what are risk-sharing relationships? The whole healthcare reimbursement system is moving from volume to value and how we pay providers, doctors, hospitals, and the like. So this is a similar transformation between paying pharmaceutical companies for how much drug is used, how many pills are used, how many injections are used, to the value those drugs bring to the patient and their well-being. So it may be based upon a specific amount of drug so that there's a cap on how much drug might be uh, paid for. And if the patient needs more courses of chemotherapy, that would all be incorporated in that price. It might also be basically paying the pharmaceutical company based upon the clinical performance, how well the patients are doing, what types of outcomes are achieved. So phase one of the study uh, we looked at the University of Washington database and found that there were about 145 different risk-sharing relationships between payers and the pharmaceutical companies uh, worldwide. That seems like a large number. However, what we noticed was over the last couple of years, the number of these relationships was really starting to slow down. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So phase two of the study was a series of interviews, about 14 interviews with pharmaceutical company representation and payers. And we were really trying to understand the benefits and the challenges that these type of interactions and contracts create. So on the benefits side, there's a lot of excitement that for the payer, when a new drug comes out, there's uncertainty. You know, is it going to work? How expensive will it be? How many patients might need it? How much of the drug might they need? And so these type of risk-sharing relationships reduce that uncertainty for the payers. The second piece of the puzzle is, because of uncertainty, payers might put a lot of barriers between um, the patient and access to that new type of therapy. And so these type of relationships actually make that access uh, better and faster and more forthcoming. So that's on the good side. Risk-sharing relationships also have challenges, as we learned. And there were three that were identified. The first is, to determine how patients did requires a lot of data, clinical data, volume data. Some of that's easy to collect, and a lot of it is very, very challenging in current data environments. Second piece of the puzzle is, the payment to the pharmaceutical industry relates to how well the patients did. And that relates a lot to whether the patient filled their medication, took it on a regular basis. And so the performance is about things that the pharmaceutical industry may have very little control. The third piece of the puzzle is a quirk of Medicaid pricing and that these type of relationships and what happens in the real world of how the patients do might affect what is perceived as best price. And so although this is one relationship on one contract with one payer, it could percolate much more broadly, and that places some of the pharmaceutical uh, folks that we, we chatted with in a little bit of concern. So where do we go from here? I mentioned earlier that there was a slowdown in the number of them. What we're learning from the interviews is that might actually change quite a bit for two reasons. One is with electronic health records, the data collection may get easier and easier, part one. And part two, there's a whole series of new players now with accountable care organizations where providers are taking on risk and sharing some of that risk with the pharmaceutical industry might be very, very advantageous for all.